before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. The debates had to do with, A, what is this new art about? It seems to have a different relationship to representation, to the image. Might it be related to the critique of representation? I'm Ben Davis, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Hal Foster is one of the most well-known thinkers about art today. In a career that spans several decades, he is known for important, much-cited books, including The Return of the Real from 1996, Design and Crime from 2002, and most recently, Brutal Aesthetics from 2020. He teaches at Princeton and writes for a broader audience at Art Forum and the London Review of Books, among many other places. And anyone who has studied art theory or contemporary art is probably familiar with a book he edited in 1983, the anti-aesthetic. Put out by the Bay Press, the slim, purple, 150-page collection brought together nine essays by figures including Jürgen Habermas, Rosalind Krauss, Frederick Jameson, and Edward Said, plus an introduction by Foster himself, theorizing in exciting, contradictory, then-new ways what it meant to write about, make, and see art. It set the tone for a lot of the criticism and reception of art theory in the 1980s and beyond, and helped make theory cool in art. Indeed, this small book has cast such a long shadow that Foster has just published a text for Art Forum, The Anti-Aesthetic at 40, where he assesses its legacy four decades on from its publication. When I read it, I was reminded of the sense of intellectual excitement and seriousness of purpose that drew me personally into writing about art in the first place, a sense that feels very embattled now. In some ways, when I go back to the debates between thinkers in the anti-aesthetic today, they feel both like a celebration of art theory and as if you are hearing thinkers already discover and debate the limits of theory in a way that feels very different from now, but that also foreshadows some contemporary anxieties about the place and purpose of art and writing about art in the sped up, embattled present. Foster was kind enough to talk about the recent past and present of art criticism with me. Hal, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Ben. So I just wanted to first start with the kind of setting the stage human dimension of this conversation. You were working at Art in America at the time that the anti-aesthetic emerged. Where were you coming from at the time? Well, I had come to New York right after college and began to write criticism for Art Forum. I was arrogant enough to believe that I could. I was also at Columbia. I was drawn there by Edward Said. It was just after the moment of his book, Orientalism. But there were also people like Sauveur Lautranger, who was very busy with French theorists. He would bring them, publish them. So it was a real encounter with critical theory at Columbia. And I somehow needed or wanted to figure out the relationship of critical theory, French, German, and other, its relationship to the contemporary art that I saw, that I reviewed. And there was another dimension here, too. I was involved in the Institute of Architecture, the kind of site where lots of debates around architecture, postmodern architecture, people like Peter Eisenman, Kenneth Frampton. That was very important to me, too. So, in a way, it was a triangulation of sites, of forces, and just to add another to make it a square, I had already become involved with a cohort of artists and critics that came to be known as the pictures generation. Right. So those were really the vectors in my life at the moment of the anti-aesthetic. And as you say, I was already an editor at Art in America alongside Greg Owens. So that magazine was a venue where some of these problems, questions, whatever you want to call them, were worked over, were processed. What were like the big kind of debates on the art criticism scene? You know, because you're working at Art America. It's kind of where theory touches art practice. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be hard to imagine 
But Art America, I think, in large part because of Craig and for me, too, to an extent, it was the liveliest magazine for art criticism because we were in touch with these young artists and we were in touch with critical theory that seemed to be new and seemed to be relevant to the reading of this new art. You know, I think Art Forum was in a, a lull. We were also connected with October, which was fairly new at the time. So obviously Art in America was closer to the art world, closer to the art market, but we were somehow able to get the debates that had begun to develop in October into wider circulation through Art in America. But the debates had to do with, A, what is this new art about? It seems to have a different relationship to representation, to the image. Might it be related to the critique of representation that seemed to be central to post-structuralist theory? How can we motivate this new or fairly new term, postmodernism? It was already seized by architects, but postmodern architecture was a really a return to historical symbols and a turn to pop images, and we wanted nothing to do with it. So we wanted to articulate a different relation to postmodernism. And we were also very much opposed to the return to figurative painting, to traditional sculpture. And we saw all of this, the architecture and the art, as anti-modernist rather than postmodernist. So we wanted to articulate a properly postmodernist position when it came to art as well. So there are all these things in play at the same time. I really want to talk about all those debates, but before we get into them more granularly, you talk a little bit in The Anti-Aesthetic at 40 about how this particular and particularly influential collection of essays came together. You were 28 when you were putting this together, and it was kind of, you were meshed in these multiple scenes. What was this constellation of thinkers in The Anti-Aesthetic? It wasn't a constellation. That was the problem for me, and that was the prompt for me. It seemed to me that there were these discussions, but they were separate, that there were points of contact, points of convergence even, but also points of conflict. Yeah, it's really clear that it's not a school. It's like a, it's a dialogue, really. Absolutely. It's kind of what makes it exciting, actually. You feel like you're in the middle of a very exciting debate. I mean, that's part of the excitement about it, is that there are debates that are at stake that people are talking about. Yeah. And that Debate really hadn't happened. It had to be staged virtually. And at that point, the book was the only proper medium for such a thing. But I was quite conscious that it was a very mixed bag when it came to political affiliations and theoretical lineages. I mean, the book begins with a text about the Enlightenment, the call for return to Enlightenment values by Jürgen Habermas, a late Frankfurt School thinker. So in a way, that first text is really a foil for the other text, as it really wanted to argue for the need to sustain certain aspects of modern disciplinarity, if you like. And, you know, that was carried through by some of the other texts. The text by Kenneth Frampton on critical regionalism was also devoted to Enlightenment values. But the book's quickly turns to emphatically postmodernist positions, too. Yeah. It's important to, to remember that there are these different terms in play in the book, modernity, modernism, modernization. They're not all synonyms. The modernism that we had in mind was a fairly narrow one, fairly parochial one. We were still at odds with a kind of formless idea of modernism that Clement Greenberg had developed and others had uh, elaborated. So our local battle, if you like, was to do with that modernism. But we saw our postmodernism as a way to open up modernism to the many modernisms that exist within its historical field. We felt that Greenberg and company had reduced the scope, the force of modernism drastically. And, and that's a point that I think is lost Today is maybe lost even then that our postmodernism was also a way to 
return to modernism and to open it up to its complexity. Well, you mentioned the pictures generation as a term, a very influential show curated by Douglas Crimp at Artist Space a few years before this collection came out, which brought together a bunch of artists working with appropriated images. So it is almost like people are already working in like new kinds of ways and trying to like draw on different art histories in practice. And then there's this new artists who are working in pretty heady ways, pretty theoretical ways, ways that like when you look at the images, it requires you to think about what you're looking at. And then it seems like the art criticism came in and was like, there's this moment when theory takes on a new important in dialogue with artists who are already working in more theoretical ways and the artists kind of adopt some some of that theory as a motivating force and these things feed on each other. Is that kind of how you see that art history or that moment? I would say a few things in response. The show pictures was important, but I think the texts that developed around it, from it, mm-hmm. were far more important. I mean, there were texts by Douglas Crimp, to be sure, but also Craig Owens, Benjamin Buclo, other critics, feminist critics like Abigail Solomon Godot, I contributed to. So it was a whole discursive formation, and it wasn't all post-structuralist. The importance of feminism was not to be denied. Um, that really drove the critique of mass cultural images that were taken up by the pictures artists. And also just a very different perspective from the Frankfurt School. And Marx's critique was extremely significant, and, and Buclo there represented that line. So the show was important. I think the discourse was more important. It was various. It was conflicted, but that made it all the more lively. I wouldn't say that the artists were particularly theoretical. You know, with a few exceptions, I mean, Barbara Kruger is a very theoretical artist in the sense that she's very concerned with the ideas in play in her work, but not many of the others that were associated with the pictures cohort were. That's not to say that the art was not theoretical. The interest for me was to see and to show precisely how art is theoretical in its own terms Mm. and to find ways in which the theory could press the art, the art could press the theory, and new ideas, new practices could be developed from that tension. So when I return to the anti-aesthetic, almost the text that stands out to me as accented now, or that kind of like explains a lot of the power of the collection, is one that people don't cite as much, which is Gregory Ulmer's essay, The Object of Post-Criticism. And he actually makes this really interesting point about theory itself, that theory has this new status and writing about art aesthetics has assumed some of the energy of art. And I feel like that's almost what the collection is capturing. And you really feel, you know, whether it's in Craig Owens reading Foucault and talking about how some of that theorization can be used to understand Robert Rauschenberg and postmodern art, or Rosalind Krauss's famous essay that's in the collection, Sculpture in the Expanded Field, which has this iconic gesture of like deriving all the possible forms of contemporary sculpture, making from a semiotic square, a graphic representation of logical possibilities. It does feel like there's this moment when like there's this burst of import of new ideas into the contemporary art discourse. In The Anti-Aesthetic at 40, you talk about how a lot of theoretical traditions that actually come from very different starting points and are in tension with each other, like the Frankfurt School and some aspects of French theory, um, French feminist theory, French post-structuralist theory, kind of arrived all together in the United States. And I don't know, am I interpreting that right? I feel like there's just kind of like actually just fascination with theory as a kind of aesthetic object at this moment. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the projects of the book was to sort out the different theoretical models that arrived. And that was almost by the side that that became a central part of the book. I did want to have different figures with diverse approaches. But 
to go back just a bit to the Gregory Omer text, I wanted a text that would treat the question of postmodern literature. And I asked a few people like Hugh Kenner, great modernist uh, literary yeah. critic. He didn't really know what to do, and others declined as well. And I think it's because the writers that were associated with the postmodern could be seen as like ultra modernist figures like Thomas Pynchon or William Gaddis or Don DeLillo, or Robert Coover, many. And there was a way, I think, that for many of us in my generation, theory had become the writing, the literature, if you like, that engaged us the most. A couple of years before the anti-aesthetic, Rosalind Krauss wrote a short text called The Paraliterary, mm. where she basically announces as much that young people turn to figures like Bart and Derrida. That's the modernist experiment in writing carried forward that interested us. But it wasn't simply a confusion of the literary and the theoretical. I think that mistakes what was at stake here. I think my generation, that sounds grandiose, but it's a convenient shorthand. My generation experienced a certain displacement of the avant-garde. In other words, there's a way in which for the generation of Greenberg, there was a displacement of political vanguardism to an artistic avant-garde. Sure, yeah. These guys were all kind of disillusioned Trotskyists who put a lot of that energy into like debating the right advanced sect of art to be associated with. Absolutely. I mean, that's there in the young Greenberg and avant-garde and kitsch. The avant-garde emerges as a way to carry culture forward. And if the political dialectic in the Marxist scheme of things seem to have faltered, not just faltered, but collapsed with Stalin, one had to look elsewhere to critical culture and critical art. That motivated that project to a great degree. I think after 1968 and the retreat on many fronts that we saw in the 1970s and retreat from political movements, there was a further displacement of the avant-garde into theory. And I think that explains a good part of the political energies in theory at the time and indeed the cultural excitement in theory right, at the time. Right. Something that I thought was really striking in the anti-aesthetic at 40 was, look, we're talking about theory and these are like heady things. And I think maybe to the largest number of people is associated with academic forms of writing about art because it's drawing on philosophy and semiotics and cultural theory that are you know, very high flown and have a very specialized language. But you point out that the anti-aesthetic wasn't an academic collection, that it was put out by, you know, an indie publisher, the Bay Press. And I find that a fascinating thing about this moment, the early 80s moment, the moment of this kind of canonization or when these kind of debates become part of the art conversation in, in a really huge and influential way is that it may have moved into academia or drawn on academia, but it had a purchase outside of that. And maybe some of that energy is lost. Maybe that outside vanishes as the kind of political energies that animate that you're talking about get undermined or fade away in the yuppie 80s. Or maybe, you know, academia serves a role in kind of like drinking the kind of grassroots juices there was here. You know, there's an intellectual scene around this stuff that wasn't just academic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are many things in your comment to parse. First, I would say we were still independent critics. One could still be an independent critic. We were magazine writers, magazine editors. We worked at galleries, museums. We got by. It was relatively cheap, you know, quite cheap, actually. Yeah, there's also the East Village moment, you know? No, this is before the East Village. New York was still effectively bankrupt. So it was right. inexpensive to live. You didn't need much money. We could live within 10 blocks of each other so we could talk, hang out, 
In other words, there were material conditions that allowed for independent criticism. Right. And you also have to remember that the academy was a very different thing back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, in part because of the recession, academic careers looked really grim in the late 1970s, early 1980s. But the academy also was grim in another way, in the sense that it didn't welcome people like us. It wasn't interested in critical theory. In fact, it was hostile to it. It wasn't interested in contemporary art. There was no such thing. You were lucky to get a course in modern art that pushed through to pop, say. So it wasn't that the academy was everywhere and that, you know, every thinker was somehow academic. Not at all. We wanted to keep this independent space as long as we could. The problem there was that that independent space began to be eroded by the market. Mm. The moment of the 1983, the anti-aesthetic, was we're deep into Thatcher. We're headed towards the second term of Reagan. We didn't really know the term then, but neoliberalism was all around us. So people like Douglas and Craig and Benjamin and I were removed in a way to the academy because we were pushed out of an art world that had become more or less coterminous with the art market. Mm. But at that early moment, the academy was the enemy. It's striking when you read your introduction, you know, it is like a whole collection of like really heady theory but academia is actually a negative term in your introduction and in other places in the essays. I mean, I'm an academic now. The academic now uh, is not a bad object to me. I think if there is any success to this movement in critical theory, it was located there. I think it transformed the humanities in the 80s and 90s and Continues. Well, and I guess I should say that, you know, the, one of the texts is Edward Said's text, which I gather was an influential figure on you. The more or less, he's theorizing the role of the public intellectual. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the title of the text or the real force of the text is the politics of interpretation. So these questions in art, architecture, criticism, theory, the museum, the university, they were not academic questions for us. These were institutions that were contested. It wasn't a stretch to call these different interpretations political because they seem to have real questions at stake, real possible effects as well. I think it's fair to say that for visual art, the anti-aesthetic collection was one of the ways that postmodernism entered in the conversation in a lasting way. The term kind of really came into major intellectual currency with Leotard's book, The Postmodern Condition. That's just like four years before the anti-aesthetic. And when I read over the book now, it's such a woolly term. It seems to contain everything and nothing. And it just, it's such a contentious term in the book. You know, it really strikes me that it's like, there's a good postmodernism and a bad postmodernism. And a lot of the stakes are trying to figure out how you would distinguish the two. So I was wondering if you could talk about that. Like, what did the term mean? Why was it useful? And why was it orienting yourself on a good and a bad side of it, like key to what was going on at that time? It was quite clear to us. It wasn't a confused situation at all. I think I mentioned there was a double front for us. We were opposed to a, a modernism that, as even Habermas says in the book, was dominant but dead. The modernism that was basically made institutional by Alfred Barr and then thought through by Greenberg and others, that was the official story in the museum, in the university. That model of modernism was one thing that we wanted to break with, again, to open up modernism to its own complexity. That was a clear line, a clear front for us. The other was much more present in terms of practice, which is the term postmodernism was already captured by architects who wanted to return to the scenography, you know, facades of, again, historical symbols and pop images. Learning from Las Vegas. Yeah. And, but 
even problematic instances in figures like Michael Graves and Robert Stern. And that had its counterpart, we thought, in neo-figurative, neo-expressionist painting and sculpture. That was, again, anti-modernist. So we wanted to articulate a postmodernism that would advance on a reduced idea of modernism, but also confront this other postmodernism that was already established and to show that it was simply anti-modernist. So the lines were clear enough to us, and that's why the term became so freighted, because there were real ramifications to how this debate would play out. At least it seemed to us at the time. Now, the problem is, you, know, you say that postmodernism means everything, nothing. That is not our fault. That's the way it was taken up quite quickly. I never thought it was merely a stylistic term, but that's how it was taken up, not by the academy, but by, if you like, the culture industry. Magazines, fashion world, cuisine, God knows, everything was called postmodern. Yeah. That's just what happens. So that's why we left the term behind and why I, I suggested in my art forum piece that there's a funny way in which modernism seems more alive as a concept in postmodernism right now. Yeah, well, even though the text was about postmodernism, the title of the collection is The Anti-Aesthetic. So you already talked about neo-figurative painting. I want to talk a little about the aesthetic. How does the aesthetic appear at this moment? Because in this turn to theory, there is also kind of a critique of, I guess, ideas of beauty or taste. So what role was the idea? idea of aesthetic playing as something to react to, I guess it's the market. I mean, it was like the idea of intellectual narratives that have given art some kind of like oomph have been replaced by just selling pretty decor. Is that where the aesthetic came in? No. I mean, that was part of it. I mean, it's a great title for the collection. I mean, I think it really sells the collection. Yeah. But for me, it had a few different meanings. Yes, there was this concern that what counted as the aesthetic sphere was now simply a matter of shiny commodities, luxury items. But it was philosophical, too. I mean, it might be hard to imagine, but deep in the Greenbergian account of art was a Kantian premise that art is about a world apart, that it's about a space of, mm. of disinterest. In Kant, quite directly, in his critique of Judgment, the aesthetic is a place of reconciliation where different kinds of rationalities, different kinds of experiences can be resolved. The contradictions between them can be resolved. So we were the legatees of many critiques of the Kantian idea of the aesthetic as art is autonomous, art is disinterested, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That was very active in the Frankfurt School, it was very active in post-structuralism. Derrida wrote a few extraordinary attacks um, that undid the Kantian presupposition about the aesthetic. But there was also the sense that the art that most concerned us was interventionist, that it right. still could have political effects because it intervened in representations that were all around us, that were taken from our culture. So here, I think we were influenced above all by Figures like Gramsci, who argued that culture, this is left culture, obviously now, needed to be anti-hegemonic, needed to take on the assumptions about art, the assumptions about the aesthetic that were installed in the museum and in the university. That was really the force behind the term, the motto, anti-aesthetic. I mean, that kind of anti-Kantian dimension and the kind of pro-Gramscian dimension. Those two things were extremely important to us. Obviously, the status of the aesthetic is very different now. The status of the beautiful is very different. There's a return to these concerns, to these experiences. And I understand why. I mean, I, I see it in part as a, as a way to reimagine a place, maybe a world a little bit apart from... How terrible everything is. How terrible everything is. And that that's not an escape... That's a place apart that can question the traumas of the present, the traumas of the past, too. 
I mean, that's how we see the beautiful, the aesthetic work in a whole range of African-American artists, for example. That interest in the beautiful, that interest in the aesthetic was not in play in 1983 at all. So maybe the most influential text in the collection was The Discourse of Others, Feminists and Postmodernism by Craig Owens. And specifically, it tried to bring together a feminist critique of patriarchal culture and the postmodern critique of modernist culture. And it helped define and give a powerful value to a canon of artists, some of whom we've already mentioned, and align them with the critical postmodern or the good postmodernism. So that was figures like Jenny Holzer, Sherry Levine, Louise Lawler, people who were doing work with text and art, drawing from media culture and reworking it in a post-conceptual kind of way. So I guess I just wonder, I mean, how did you or Owens think about that role for theory, that it was like value forming? It was helping to define a canon of value because so much else in the collection is wrapped up in this critique of the culture industry and the art market and so on. Well, again, feminism was very important to our cohort and it's often discussed as a second generation of feminism that feminism that was very informed by critical theory. So we were all readers, for example, of Screen Magazine, where the critique of representation was kind of worked out in relation to film. And many of the main players, both in practice and in theory, were feminists. And that was certainly the case with the pictures group. So it wasn't a stretch to stress the feminist force of the art and the arguments that we wanted to make. But the genius of the text by Craig was to really show how that feminist critique was aligned with the post-structuralist critique and that one, in a way, could not do without the other. Now, a text, maybe the one text that produced a particular canon formation around the artist that you named? This is a vexed question for me, not only because we were very concerned about, you know, as critics, about our our ability to mm-hmm. produce value, to produce market value. We were very cautious about it. And that's why many of us, I think, withdrew from contemporary criticism because we were concerned about it. But this is also the moment when critics become less important to value right. creation and to canon formation, that status is the great mediator that critics often were in the past, you know, from Baudelaire through Greenberg. That status had begun to fall away. And a new nexus of dealers and collectors made value, made canons. I'm also vexed by the question because... Now it's often said that, oh, this art criticism of the 1980s became the art history of the 1980s, that it was taken as this historical truth. You know, I don't know how to reply to that charge, if it is a charge, if it is an accusation, but one one often hears that now. Well, I mean, I guess the reason I ask, or what's on my mind, is that I'm nostalgic for this era of theory. Like I said at the top, just the seriousness of it, the sense that through art, there are these bigger conversations about what it means to make meaning or be a person that are going on about where you sit in history. Like, I feel like that's really lacking from a lot of writing now, which is almost so postmodern that it's invisible (laughs) in the sense that in the book, Jameson talks about the disintegration of time. You know, there's no historical location to the way people think about culture. They were just atoms floating around and the past and the present all appear simultaneously. You're not really oriented in them. That just seems like the water people swim in now. So I'm really hungry for like this. I read these texts and I'm like, wow, this is just like people generalizing and bringing in ideas. And then I'm just trying to figure out I think people's theory criticism, what it became, is that it became and it's kind of ironic because it's so much about questioning grand narratives and being able to speak from an outside master position. 
is that I think people's criticism of theory criticism is that it made art into illustrations of theory, you know, that it became wall text material, ways that curator is kind of like a shorthand for importance. And I'm just wondering how you can like have your cake and eat it too, I guess, you know, have the ideas and not let them just become, you know, brand names, you know? Yeah, I don't think that we even had the cake, let alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't think you can be blamed for the reception of your work or the assimilation, the recuperation, whatever you want to say. Sure, there was a way in which theory became lingo and it became a kind of soup of jargon, but that's not all it became. And of course, at times, theory was applied to art, was imposed on art, perhaps. But at its best, I think it's best was far more frequent than people might allow today, criticism really showed how art was theoretical in its own terms. Mm. It didn't just speak the art, and the art didn't simply illustrate the theory. It was a point of really productive engagement. Again, many of the pictures artists were not theoretical, but the work was, and the, the critic could actually demonstrate how it was and how it actually innovated theoretically in its own terms. So I, I always bristle a little bit when people say, oh, your old criticism or criticism of your time was simply applied or imposed. I don't think that that's true. I think certainly that's what happened in other quarters, but that can't be blamed on us. I want to push back a little bit on your nostalgia. It was a great moment. It was great to be a, a young critic in the mix with that art, with that thought all around us. But I'd say this is a really good moment for critique, too. And here I really see the shortcomings of the anti-aesthetic. I think I mentioned in the Art Forum piece that there's only one woman represented. That there is a piece on feminist art, but it's written by a man. He was gay. But there's not any real opening out to queer aesthetics, queer theory mm -hmm. yet. I mean, it was still to come, largely. But I could have been, should have been more alert. I think that's also true, even though Said was represented, there, the book didn't delve into the connection between postmodernism and postcolonialism to the extent that it could. That's why I want to push back a little bit on your nostalgia, because I see not only the elaborations of feminist theory into queer theory, but elaboration of post-colonial discourse into a whole range of propositions about Black aesthetics and Black practice now that I think has really animated criticism and theory over the last period of time. I think they can be glimpsed in the anti-aesthetic, but they are not really showcase there yet. That's a historical limitation, but also my own restriction too, I suppose. I look back on that moment fondly too, but I also am very um, taken by the force of ideas in the present too. That's excellent. Well, it strikes me, I guess following from that, reading the collection now in 2023, when we have our own very politicized climate of culture wars. You've already talked about it quite a bit, but really beneath these various debates about the aesthetic and postmodernism, it really strikes me that the concrete reference is neoconservatism and Reagan. Edward Said says that directly in the opening lines of his last piece. He's the most direct about it. He says, for me, the question of criticism has to be about the moment of the age of Reagan and what it means to write now. I think he's specifically one of the exhilarating things about the text. He's a little bit taking a tax. Frederick Jameson, who is also included in the collection and is probably one of the big names people associate with the term postmodernism. He's the one who theorized postmodernism as the cultural logic of late capitalism. And so there is a real political intervention that's being made or debated beneath all this. 
in the art forum text on the anniversary, you note of that moment, even as the left was in political retreat, it had advanced on cultural fronts. And mention the editor of another journal who had told you, critical journals are the political parties of our time. So to me, that's just very pregnant material for thinking about theory, practice, the relationship of art and politics in then and in the present, because it does seem to me there is... I don't know whether you want to call it an advance or a retreat of politics into culture um, that can push some things forward, but also becomes kind of a cul-de-sac and, you know, a proxy for politics outside of the museum or outside of the academy. What do you make of that whole legacy of cultural politics in relationship to that moment and now? We wanted to re-engage art criticism, culture, in an interventionist way. We didn't want to retreat. We didn't see culture as a withdrawal from politics. It was quite clear to us that Reagan represented an attack on the movements and the values of the 1960s. And we were up for the fight with our very limited means and our very limited battlefields. And it was obvious that the enemy was neoconservatism. What wasn't quite as obvious was that neoconservatism as a cultural political ideology was united with neoliberalism as a political economic operation. People understand now, too, just terminologically, that they would be bound up with each other. But in that early formation of Thatcher and Reagan, it was economically deregulate everything, you know, strip the state away, demolish welfare to the extent possible, and to compensate for this scorched earth set of policies economically, you know, return to tradition, reaffirm the family, moral values are all. That was a very contradictory complex yeah, of yeah. cultural and political ideas. So, we wanted to disarticulate it and in that encounter do what we could in our limited ways to reanimate cultural forces of the left. So it wasn't at all withdrawal from politics and it did seem extreme. It, the problem now is that <laughs> it's all relativized. You know, there's a way in which Bush relativized Reagan and Trump relativized Bush as we veer further and further to the right. You mean, I mean, made it seem less and less extreme. Is that what you mean? Yeah. For example, as political theorists like Wendy Brown have argued, that complex of neoliberalism and neoconservatism is broken up. The right has ditched any serious call for tradition or family or morality. Now it's neoliberalism and nihilism. Yeah. That's what Trump represents. And we thought that if there was an avant-garde, we were in relation to it. If there was a real radical position on cultural and politics, it was like ours or similar to ours. Now the real radical force for the last period of time, clearly, is on the right. Mm -hmm. And that puts us in a very different position. So it certainly seemed like an extreme situation at the time. And that certainly animated us, but it's nothing like what we've gone through since. So where does that lead? Well, it leads many people to argue that any idea that art can be somehow interventionist is pathetic. It leads to just different versions of defeatism on that score. Right. And that's a mistake. And that's one reason why I wanted to look back on this moment, not to bury it, not really even to praise it, but to see if that dimension could be reanimated. Well, that's excellent. I was going to apologize for having taken us from your qualified optimism into a more bleak place, but you brought it back there yourself. And I think that answers my final question, which was going to be, what do you hope people still get when they pick up this text now? Unless you have something more to say about that. And maybe this is where I, I can wax nostalgic. I do think it was a time when art, theory, politics, and even history were in very dynamic tension with each other. One wasn't 
applied or imposed on the other. They were at least potentially in conversation, and the anti-aesthetic was produced to push that conversation along. And other books, other fora picked up on it and pushed that conversation on. I think that kind of conversation can always be restarted. If a look back right now would urge people to do that, then that would be extraordinary. Well, I think that's a fantastic ending point for this conversation. Al, I really appreciate your time. And thank you. It's really fun for me to talk with you. Well, that's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you liked what you've heard, please like the show or subscribe to it at Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any of the other many places you can subscribe to podcasts. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili and Caroline Goldstein. Thank you for listening and see you next week. Thank you.